Hello, welcome to Literary Life and welcome to this video where I'm going to share with you some book reviews of the books that I have been reading this past maybe week and a half, two weeks now. Uh, there is quite a mix of reviews here, so definitely get ready, get something to drink. We have a number of books and they're going to be highs and lows. Now, if you're new to my channel, welcome. My book reviews are spoiler free. I'll give every book one to five stars. One star, I didn't like the book, probably didn't even finish reading it. Two stars, eh, it's an okay book. Three stars, it's a good book. I liked it and I would certainly recommend it to some people. Four stars, great book. I loved it, would recommend it to a lot of people. And then five stars, more random books that just absolutely blow my mind and I do want you all to read them. All right, so let's get started. Um, we're going to start lowest to highest. And I was actually surprised because I did not expect from this stack of books to have a one star book that I would DNF, but I did. Um, so I will be so curious if any of you have read this book to hear your thoughts below. I love to see the diversity of opinions and reading experiences. And I think it helps other viewers if they're trying to determine, well, but is this, you know, just because one person doesn't like the book, what's the right taste for me? So let's start with that book. And as always, guys, jump in below with your thoughts if you've read the book. I had a hard time with this one, Sympatia. I just could not get into it. And I did DNF it halfway through. Um, I just knew I had so many books waiting here. And um, yeah, and I was really, really surprised by that. So this book was translated from Spanish. It is long listed for the International Booker Prize. So not a book I would have expected not to have found engaging for me. Um, it's set in Venezuela. And our main character is a man who was adopted um, as a young child. He was originally um, in an orphanage raised by priests. And this is definitely a core part of his identity, that kind of absence of family um, and that absence of uh, really a, a community and an identity that's tied in somewhere with someone. And he is, um, you know, in Venezuela, and this is a country who's going through very difficult times. So a lot of people have um, chosen to leave the country. And due to the circumstances of their departure, limited resources, limited options, what is happening is a lot of them are leaving their animals, in particular dogs, behind. Um, our main character, he is recently divorced, and he is actually incredibly close with his ex-father-in-law. And we're going to find that um, his ex-wife had departed, also left Venezuela, and his ex-father-in-law um, passes away and in doing so leaves an, a building to our main character. Again, they had a very close relationship that continued even after the separation or divorce um, with the man's daughter. And it, But a requirement of that is that he uses it within a year. He has to successfully have put up a dog sanctuary, a rescue for all of the animals that are being left behind. In the course of doing that, he is going to meet, and therefore we, the readers, will meet a couple who started a dog sanctuary and rescue who will partner with him on this mission. Um, and we're also going to meet a love interest of his. Um, I just found this, for me, the story was very scattered. And I've very often found myself completely kind of lost as far as, okay, who a lot of characters were coming and going. Um, I What was happening felt like it was disconnected at some points and jumping around, like I said, scattered so that I felt very disoriented. And there are times when I can say, okay, I think this is an intentional experience that this writer is creating. For me, it didn't feel that way. It didn't feel like it was a part of the story. And it made it harder for me to actually get engaged. I had to force my way through the first half of this book. I also felt like there wasn't enough detail or depth to the plot itself or even to the characters where I really felt engaged with any of them. I didn't find um, the majority of the characters to be likable or even interesting people where... 
I was excited when they presented themselves on the page or curious about what they were going to do next. They, they Everything just felt to me very flat. And between the flat component and the scattered component, I, I just completely kept struggling and I kept going and kept going. And finally, at the halfway point, I said, OK, I'm I'm going to stop this. Um, the other thing I want to call out, if you're a dog lover like myself, and uh, I was really excited. Um, the dogs aren't really a they're of like a backdrop to the story. So you're not going to, they're not going to be characters. They're not going to be heavily present. <laughs> so just, that's just an FYI. If you're like me and you're like, yes, yeah, a book about dogs. It's yeah, it's about dogs, but not really about dogs. So <laughs> um, if you do choose to pick this up or you're reading the long list, I just want to kind of set those expectations. So unfortunately for me, this one was a, a DNF, um, a one star I'm going to put it up in my Pango shop. So if this is a copy that you want to get a hold of, um, know that it will be there. All right. Thankfully, there were not any two star books. Um, let's go into some of the three star books. Now, this means I thought these were good books and um, I would definitely recommend them to some of you. OK, we're going to start with White Nights. This is by Ursula Honig. Now, this is uh, translated from Poet. Uh, Polish. <laughs> this author, I had, think I had mentioned this in another video, this author has previously published poetry. So this is her first um, fiction debut. It is a short story collection and we're going to be set in a mountainous village in um, Poland. And the 13 of uh, the stories here are each going to really be centered on a unique narrator that is part of this village. Um, and each of the stories are going to be interconnected in some way. What's going to happen is that uh, throughout the village, you know, every narrator or somebody that the narrator is observing in the story is going to have some difficulty, some struggle, in some cases, total tragedy befall them. And we're going to watch how both the individuals and the community respond to these moments and cope um, with what they're experiencing. I am going to tell you guys right now, I created a, a, a character <laughs> map <laughs> and because it was I, I knew that the value I knew that hidden in this was a gem of that interconnectivity. And for me, anytime I'm reading names that are not typical names, OK, even with typical like American names, I still will have to often create character trackers um, when there are a lot of characters just that's my brain. Sometimes nowadays I can't follow <laughs> four characters. I got to remind myself of who's who. So that becomes much more complicated for me when I'm reading names that aren't typical, very familiar, easy names. They're more foreign, especially if they're phonetically similar. I can more easily confuse them. I find that a lot with Asian names and Eastern European names. Um, so I highly recommend if you're like me, do get ready, track the characters, because you are going to find that characters in whom the first story, for example, are your main protagonist, you're seeing it through their point of view, will be a key character in another story. Um, but they're, you're seeing them through the eyes of somebody else. Or they may be a tertiary character, but it's helpful. It adds to the story if you can recall, oh, yes, this is, um, I'm going to call him Andre, even though that's not his name. Um, it's, I, I don't even know how, Andre, yeah, I can't even pronounce it. I'm so curious. I should actually look these names up in Polish for fun. I should have done that while reading. So I would recommend that too. <laughs> I'm going to do that with the next book. Um, but it really does help. It, it, it adds a lot to the story and to the feel because you understand, even for a tertiary character, what their background was. There are over a dozen, I feel like, characters that I track throughout this story. Um, so definitely, I would say this is one I would go in ready for that. But do know that that tracking and getting to know this village and all of the relationships in between them um, does add a lot. The other thing that I found difficult, um, disorientingly difficult, was the fact that the writing changes, it pivots from first person point of view to second and to third, depending on which story you are in. 
this is a case, unlike the last book I just spoke about, where I feel like it almost was intentional um, because you did feel very disoriented as you were shifting through. And I feel like in in a way that almost paralleled what our characters in the book were experiencing as they were negotiating the challenges in their day-to-day lives. There's also a couple things I want to highlight with this author's writing style, and I wonder if it comes from the fact that historically she is a poet and this is her first fiction piece, and I think it gives it a very unique flavor um, as a reader. And that's at the tone of the writing. It's very uncomfortable, but it's also bizarre in almost like a dreamlike way. So there was always something that left me feeling a little almost off kilter in a different way than the disorientation. And I think dreamlike is the best way for me to capture that for you all. So I found Mm -hmm. it to be a really interesting read. Um, for that reason in and of itself. So, and I do have a, I have not read this author's poetry, but I do think that it very much comes from having a poet who is now creating literature and you you still have that. Di- it's just a different way of um, crafting a narrative to me than what you typically will experience. And I think for those of us that really are looking for unique reads and we're trying to branch out, I would highly recommend this to those readers um, in particular. So for me, this was a solid three-star read. It is a good book. Um, I really enjoyed the, the uniqueness of the way the writing was carried through. And then the complexity of exploring this village through all these different lenses and uh, just the overall feel um, that the author brought forward about these characters. All right, the next book that was also a three-star read for me was At Dusk by Huang Sok-yong. Now, this is the author of another book I'm going to discuss in this book review. This book was long-listed for the International Booker, and this author is also has a book that's long-listed this year for the International Booker Prize, as well as now shortlisted. He made the shortlist. Um, this is the first, this book and his other one I'll talk about shortly are the first books I've read by this Korean author. Now, this particular book, um, we're going to focus on, it's set in South Korea, and we are really exploring the history of Korea through um, socioeconomic status, essentially. And we have a main character, Park Min Woo, I believe is his name, who grew up in the slums. And we're going to get a little bit of his memories of what life was like at that time. And the dangers um, that were part of, inherent of that type of life's life, because you had the the gangs and a lot of the criminal activity, um, the risks that came with that. But he is going to be able to move himself out of that and, and grow higher on the socioeconomic status ladder through getting an education and then becoming an architect. And so... When we meet him or when we are getting we are with him as an adult, he is a very successful man. Um, older man, I believe he's in his 50s, if not 60s. And what is going to happen is he is going to receive a message from a female childhood friend of his. Um, and that receiving that message um, from this woman about, you know, her wanting um her, her being there in the area and would like to see him is going to bring back a lot of his memories of this woman. So through his memories, we're going to hear her backstory. And it's a very sad story. Um, this was a, a, a young girl at the time when he was a young man, a young woman that he had um, feelings for and attraction to. Um, she was, you know, the beauty of the village and We're going to learn about what happened when their paths diverted, um, what her life has been like, and how different different the realities of living in South Korea can be dependent on, and I think this is the same with any country, but depending on what your socioeconomic status is. Um, But what's interesting is that while we're hearing his point of view and his story throughout the book, he's really one of our narrators. We're going to meet a young woman who has a very different life than him. Um, She is a script writer. She struggles to get by. She has to work at a convenience store in the evenings just to keep a roof over her head and some 
amount of food in her belly. And she's going to be the one that will actually deliver the message from his childhood friend, from the woman to him. Um, so really outside of that, that's how their paths will cross. But her, we're going to get this parallel sense of his life, his history, um, and how he throughout his life, you know, is able to climb out of poverty and simultaneously we'll be getting to know the young woman who's going to be the messenger um, and we're going to see her life and what it's like to be in poverty. And then we're going to have a very tragic story, um, I feel like, of this other woman um, who was this is the same age as Park Min Wu, our first protagonist, and how her life went down. She had the same originating place and setting as our is Park, but then her life um, went in a different direction. So it's a very mild um, writing style. I'm going to say the pacing was slow to medium. Um, so it is a comfortable read. I think, again, if you're like really interested in getting out um, and reading more translated literature, uh, this is, you know, a well-respected author, a well-respected book. Um, I, I do, and I'll talk about Mater 210 here shortly. I did enjoy that book more. Um, but I think that this also gives you an interesting day-to-day -day glimpse into uh, South Korea and some of the challenges that that community um, faces. Now let's talk about, we're going to completely jump countries. We're going to come over into the United States, into Oregon, which is a, a state on the Northwest um, part of the country. For those of you not familiar with Oregon, um, to Sleeping Giants by Renee Denfeld. Now, this is a thriller slash mystery book, and I love Renee Denfeld. I forget the first book I read by her, but she has such a unique way with langu language. And when I think about like unique thrillers and people that I really enjoy the way they it, they just have an artistic lens. You know, I think of like Louise Penny for more mystery, but she does have a thriller aspect. Tanya French. Renee Denfeld's like that. Um, I would say her books, uh, this one is a three star. It's a good book. Some of her books have been four stars and five stars. Um, so this one I thought was an interesting book. And I'll talk to you obviously about what it's about here in a second. Um, but if you haven't read Renee Denfeld, um, I would definitely start with um, some of her other books, and I'm totally blanking on their names. Um, the Enchanted was one about the being in a prison. Um, it is not your typical thriller, though. She has ones that are more mystery thriller, so if that's your preferred genre, you can always ask me below if you look one up that interests you, and I'll let you know if I, like, yes, that's one that I would highly, highly recommend. But this particular book, like I said, is set in Oregon, and we have a community where a uh, boys, uh, like a, a detention um, kind of home, uh, a place where they did behavioral therapy for boys that were considered troubled, but really orphaned boys um, were taken there as well. And when we say troubled, it could be due to um, normal acting out and just not having available parents, having parents that were criminals and they were just put into the system or in some cases being homosexual and that was considered deviants. So they were sent into this facility. And this facility is next to a little town in Oregon that isn't a big touristy town. Um, the beach, that area, uh, the ocean is very dangerous. It's very active. So it's not like a, a beach that people just hang out and can go swimming in. So the tourist draw to this town, I would say, is absent. And our main character is going to be a um, retired police officer who has moved to this area. It was his wife's desire, um, but she unfortunately passes away. Um, so he is left in the cabin they built. And he is going to meet a young woman who comes to this town um, basically looking for uh, a deceased brother of hers that she never knew. Um, her brother was older than her, and he had been one of the boys that were in this home and had escaped somehow and run into the ocean and drowned. And she is coming just to, um, and not just, I mean, really to get to know more about her brother, who he was and what happened. And in coming to the town to investigate his death, that's going to open up 
a can of worms and we're going to learn she's going to partner up with our retired police um, detective or uh, cop and they're going to um, uncover more about this detention facility therapeutic home than um, originally expected and it's going to set off a series of events Um, you know I found this book I would say this is really a 3.5 uh, there's a lot I, the, of characters that you'll get to know that I think um, were very interesting. I really liked the characters. I actually was able to predict where the story was going and what who who done it, <laughs> but not in a way that it took away from the enjoyment of the story. Renee Dunfill's writing is so just good. I think that you can, even if you know where it's headed, you just enjoy the journey. Um, so the characters were interesting. The plot was good. I, I enjoyed so much of it. There was a parallel story for our female main characters, like backstory in a sense, where she came from, the type of work she works at a zoo and takes care of a polar bear and there was a, a a parallel story where she was going off to um, uncover some things around the polar bear she takes care of. That part for me, actually, and this may have been why it landed on more three stars than four stars. On one hand, I found it really, really interesting, but it felt like a completely disconnected part of the story. So I found it almost confusing. I was a little baffled by why are we spending time on this story It was interesting and in its own right, but it almost felt like a different book. Um, So that part was kind of what threw me off. Good. It was a really, like I said, interesting, good story, but just it just felt so disconnected. Um, So I found it a little disorienting. At first, I thought somehow everything was going to come together. But that for me was a little bit off and where I struggled a little bit because I feel like it almost took away from the main mystery plot of the story. So it felt very bizarre. And I don't know if something was cut out in the editing that left it kind of that way. Um, But I am curious about that. I I may look up a little bit more from here, see if the author spoke to that um, in an interview, because I am very curious. I I feel like something may have been cut that was actually really important. (laughs) Um, So Sleeping Giants, you know, if you're a Renee Denfield fan, I would say definitely pick this one up. Um, if you like books that uh, are just, it's a good, it's a good mystery. I'll say it that way. So if you're an avid mystery reader, definitely, I think this is one you can put on your radar. It just may not be the the one I would say get to first. Okay, now we're going to move it up the ladder. We're getting into the, some four star. Okay, so let's start with the book I've already alluded to. <laughs> <laughs> That's or I flat out said the name of Mater 210 by Huang Suk Young. So this is the author, the Korean author. This book was translated for Korean and is currently now shortlisted for the International Man, Man Booker Prize for 2022. You can see this is a bit of a thicker book. Um, and it is it is a really interesting, really interesting story. So in this particular book, we're going to focus on our main character's point of view. Um, and he is a railroad worker. He's in his fifties and he is on a, um, oh, it's, it's, it's one of those high up, like not a water tower, but it's similar to that. And he's protesting. He's up there as part of a protest. And some of his coworkers, prior coworkers had done it, but essentially, and then he, he stepped in and he's up there for a number of years and we're going to be joining him, um, at that point in time. And uh, what's happened is that the company had been sold off um, and then they just let everyone go. But apparently this is something that's commonly done. And then that company will um, be really restarted. But it's it, it's done in a way, I guess, where it's financially advantageous for the owners. Um, it's an interesting thing I would like to understand. Obviously, I need to understand more about. But the, that's what's triggered this moment of protest. So again, in this book, similar to his other book, we're looking at class, we're looking at power differentials, but this time we are getting there through the lens of someone who has not climbed the ladder, who has remained in the lower socioeconomic status, wrong um, working class. What's really interesting about the way this story plays out is that 
he we're going to get to know his not just his own history in life, but four generations back. I think it is. So I definitely recommend I created a family tree as I was reading it, because we're going to get to know a lot about his like great great grandfather and then his great great grandmother. And then they had his great grandfather and, you know, and then his who he falls in love with and marries and then the child or children produced there. So it's just going to take us right down the family tree to our main protagonist. And I really enjoyed that component. Um, It was really cool to see not just Korea at these different points in time, but also the characters in their daily lives at these different points in time. The characters are very well developed. I think they are all very interesting characters. Um, So I really enjoy getting to know like that this family's history and all of the members of the family. Um, What's really unique, though, about this particular book is that Huang is going to write in almost like our main characters having almost dream dreams or visions in his present moment while he's on this tower. And, uh, you know, it could be hallucinations, but (laughs) he's going to be people from his past or from his current life are going to be present with him um, for a period of time. So we're going to get both his recollections, his memories, you know, and his and these current moments where he's experiencing engaging with people from his current life or his past. And I found that to be rather intriguing. And it gave it it gave it definitely like a magical, spiritual kind of flavor, you know, to the story itself. Um, learning about Korea, learning about the experience of the Japanese occupation, how it impacted the people of Korea, his family in particular. Very interesting. I say this is a great way for me. This is such a great way to get education around history. It's brought to life there. This is dense. There is a lot of historical content. So sometimes you can read a historical fiction book and it's like you're getting some I would say this is a really good one for people that are truly trying to learn more about Korean history, the Japanese occupation. You learn about Korea's relationship with the Chinese um, as well as the Japanese. There's just was so much here. Um, So I highly recommend this book to people that are really seeking out um, that historical knowledge. I think that this is a book that delivers it in a really consumable way, Um, but it is dense. It is in there. Uh, so the other thing I just thought was really interesting was learning about this Mater 210. Um, this is actually a locomotive. This is a true thing, a locomotive that existed. Um, and it was it played a critical po- point during the Korean War and I believe was captured by South Korea. I may have that fact wrong. But when the United States arrived, the U.S. actually destroyed it to prevent it from um, getting into enemy hands, which would have been North Korea's hands. And so it stayed in South Korea as like a rust bucket, essentially, for a significant period of time until I think it was 2004, where South Korea refurbished the locomotive. And it now sits in like a memorial um, that is both a tribute to Korean history and um, or yeah, Korean history and everything that the country has been through. So it's a real, really interesting part of history. The fact that this was a um, a locomotive. And again, our main character who's doing the protest um, worked on the trains. Uh, and so we get to learn a little bit more, too, about that industry um, as well. It was such an interesting book, guys. I really did love this book. This is one definitely, I would say, like, it's denser, it's heavier, you're going to learn a lot. Um, you know, if you need, like, I did pair it a little bit. I would jump into some thinner books, like I'll share with you here in a moment. Um, but God, this book is, it's a great book. I absolutely loved it. And this is one I, I do want to read again, because I think that there was so much here uh, that I probably, obviously, because I couldn't even recall everything just in talking about it right now. I think a few readings of this will really help. It, this book is just a gem. I mean, it's just got a lot of value, um, not just through taking you on a, a journey through reading, but also, like I said, in in learning about the history and learning about the Korean culture. So I absolutely love that book. Four stars, if I didn't say that clearly. <laughs> four stars. All right, another four-star book, guys. 
of Cattle and Men. This book made the shortlist for the Republic of Consciousness Prize. Um, the winner will be announced here soon, I think next week, um, and I will be doing a video on the winner. Um, this book, so the Republic of Consciousness Prize really quickly just honors small presses. Um, so this book was published by Charcoal Press. As you can see, this is a very thin one. So if you're like me and you like to definitely try to pull in some of these quick reads, but I'm going to say, guys, this is a, this is a, this is a dark one. Um, so this book is set in Brazil. It's set on, it reminded me of a ranch, but it is a ranch with the purpose of being a slaughterhouse. Um, so you have our main character is Edgar, and he's the man that's responsible for essentially knocking um, the cattle unconscious prior to their being slaughtered so that it is humane for them. Essentially, they don't have time to truly to feel fear um, before they are killed. And it is, oh God, there is something just so and it's not just due to the setting. The setting was important, but due to the writing style of this author and the who, um, the author Anna Paula Maia, and it's translated by Zoe Perry. They both together, because I'm reading this in English, have done a brilliant job of just being so direct in the the smells, the the setting, um, the author's thoughts. Everything is just very to the point. And in doing that way, it just feels so raw and honest, but that there's like no sugarcoating anything. And we're in this really dire situation, right, for the animals. Um, but at the same time, there's a weird humanity, kindness woven in through our main character, Yet it's also very dark. It is such a bizarre experience to read this story to me in a bizarre and a good way, not in a confusing way. But you, it's like you feel dirty and fresh at the same time. I don't I don't really I mean, it's it's a unique one. This book will stay in my head for that very reason. So we're we're with our main character, Edgar, and I explained his role on this at this job and what's going to be happening is something is going to be evolving on this ranch that is a threat some kind of threat to the animals and to the humans potentially and we don't know what it is it's all very mysterious but it's causing dissent it's causing discomfort among the animals and it's we're kind of in this ambiguous you know you have this gritty, yet, yet we have a character who has this horrific job, yet he's very humane, like he's, he's caring, but he's also just very, like we eat the whole, everything around this. The, you can even see just to me trying to talk about it, guys. This is one of those books I think would be so good for a book club, but also very difficult. So I don't think any book club should do it, but I think this is one with the right group of people where you could just have a huge, a lot of conversation because this book really is the one that makes you think about eating anything, you know, even plants are alive and the losing touch with having appreciation for the reality of what we are doing. There, there's just so much value, I think, in this story. And it's one of those stories that I think has changed my life even more than I realized when I finished reading it. I'm going to keep this one. I I don't know that I want to read it again, but I do want to read it again. <laughs> God, this one, you guys, this one is such a bizarre, bizarre book. And I love it for that very reason. So of Cattle and Men, I, I feel like this is... I need someone to read this book so we can talk about it. <laughs> I think that's where I'm at. So if you read this book, please let me know below. Because, yeah, this one is, you know, if you, I remember reading The Jungle by uh, Upton Sinclair, I think was the author. And I read that like in high school or early college, maybe. And this is like this book. It's like one of those books. Animal Farm, you know, like when you read Animal Farm. God, this is an incredible book. So anyway, <laughs> 
I feel like that was the most confusing. I think I took you through the experience of reading this book, but you also have to feel a little creeped out at the same time. <laughs> that is the one. All right, so let's stay with the creepy vibe. This one will be much easier for me to talk about. Diavola, another four star. This is really a 4.5-ish star, even though I don't normally half star them. This book, guys, I did a whole video just on this book. I will put a link to that below if you want to hear more. But man, this one, we this was referred to as like gothic fiction, gothic horror, literary horror, and it caught my attention. I am, I, this book, we have a family. We're going to get to know the family. They're dysfunctional. The dynamics in this family, wow, really well developed, well written. And then we're going to take them and they're going to be going on vacation, a multi-day. It's like a nine-day vacation together in this villa in um, Italy that is haunted. So you take a dysfunctional family, put them in a haunted villa. We have a threat. We have stress. Wow, watch the dysfunction go. It just had all the things. This book was dark. This book had well-written characters, well-written plot. It kept me on edge. It kept me engaged. It's a page turner. Um, it intellectually delivered because of the dynamics, the psychology of the individual characters, the dynamics between the family members. It's just all here. It's creepy. Like I said, oh, such a great read. And the setting is brought to life in such a way that you're like, you feel, you feel like you know the place, you can smell the air. This is a great read for this time right now. It's spring in the U.S. where I'm at, and I feel like spring and summer, or if you just need a dose of spring and summer, you can read this in the winter. But this this is a really solid book. I would recommend this to non-horror readers. So if you're a horror reader, go there, get this one. But if you're not, but you're like, I'm going to try something, this is one I would recommend. Um, for those people. All right. We've got just three more books. So go refill your drink if you need to. Um, we've got one more four star and then we've got two five stars. So let's keep going. This next book. Wow. Eight Lies of a Century Old Trickster. This book was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. <laughs> oh, wow. This is a debut book. The author lives in Hong Kong. Um, this book is going to be such a journey. So we have, we start out the book, we're with a young woman who works at an old person's um, home, essentially a care facility, and she writes obituaries. Um, she does not normally work in this one part of the facility where it's like the Alzheimer's, the memory clinic type of place because of the, the dementia, you know, because of the state of the patients there. Um, but she does go over there at one point, and that's where she's going to meet our 100-year-old trickster um, older lady who is um, a, a guest, <laughs> a staying guest at the facility. Um, and it's through their introduction and conversations that the woman is going to share our, her life, um, her lives with uh, this are, are the younger woman. And the book is organized through each of the eight lives, but they're not in chronological order. Um, so I really enjoyed getting to know each of these different periods. But this is another one where I definitely would use notes to help you track and tie everything together. Because we're going to start in her fifth life, which is in the 1960s. Then we're going to go to her first life, which is in the 1930s. Now, when I read the description of this book, I misinterpreted what I was going to be reading. So I thought it was going to be one of those um, like parallel lives or reincarnation type stories. But no, she is literally she's got a, a life line, a linear lifeline. But there's such a distinct shifts, chapters in her life, lives due to either the historical things going on in China at, at, in it during her growing up or just due to the inherent nature of her own life just changing so much. So it was really interesting to see um, the drastic shifts uh, throughout the course of her life. But taking notes, like I said, will definitely help you kind of get everything more through an easier to conceptualize linear format. 
um, because you are jumping around. This book grew on me. So if you start reading it and you're struggling a little bit, this was one where I definitely felt the more I got to know her and things started to fall into place. There were things at the beginning that you can't make sense of until you read the end. But man, when you do, it's just like, wow, this was incredible. I absolutely love this. The only thing, and not that I feel like, like, why do I need to critique this? There's something I was hungry for. I wish I could have more of. Once you go into her lives, you never come out of them back into the present. And I actually found I liked this old woman so much when you meet her through the eyes of the younger woman in the care home that I would have loved to have had like those moments to come out of the storytelling back into the present and seeing the interaction between her and the now with this young woman. I actually wanted more of that. And if that had been there, maybe this would have been a five star, but I really liked this character that much. I wanted her whole life story and I wanted to keep in touch with her in the now. I really, really enjoyed her. Um, this is another one that I really want to read again. I feel like you get a good not as all, not only is it just a good story, but to understand um, what it was like to be a woman at this point in history and in this geography, uh, what was going on historically at this point in time is so incredible. And um, just so this is one where I would love it's not as dense as Mater 210, but it's one where you definitely get exposed to the cultural differences um, from the U.S., obviously, and then the time differences in the history of what was happening um, in China and between, uh, you know, the, the respective countries um, in that part of the globe at this at this time. So it's another really good book um, for learning more about the world. So here we go, guys. Now we're going to go into the final two books. These are my five stars. OK, here we go. Two five-star books, guys. I'm so, oh, I loved, loved, love these books. Are you an Ordinary Human Failings by Megan Nolan. Wow. Okay. This book is long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. The shortlist will be announced on April 24th, and I will be doing a video on that shortlist as well as reading any books that I have not read that make the shortlist. This is an Irish author. It's set in 1990 London. And it, the, we're going to follow a family that have immigrated from Ireland into London. And what has happened is that a three-year-old child has been found murdered. And the daughter of this Irish family um, is the suspect of that murder of this younger child. And we're going to get a point of view. We're going to follow this family um, but there is a man who is a reporter who is going to interview the family. And so we're going to see the family initially through his eyes as we meet the family. We learn about the murder. We learn about the crime. And then we meet this family through his eyes, which I thought was really interesting. But then we're going to get their per point of views as well. And I think this was just a brilliant framework for bringing the story together you have so much going on here because you very much have the mystery, the the tension around this young child's murder and what happened, what who did it, what led up to it. Um, and then you have the the social components of being an uh, Irish immigrants in London, of being poor, um, the family's own backstory as individuals and as a family, the relationships between them, the dysfunction between them. It's just all here. And when I think back to the story and I look at how thin this book is, I'm actually quite floored because I'm like, how did so much get packed into so little? That speaks volumes about the writing. This is definitely, I would say, a dark, a darker story, but it's so... It doesn't lose hope. It really keeps those two um, aspects of life to what just well written, well woven together. 
Um, it's very reflective. You know me, if, you, if you've if been watching my channel, you know how I love looking at things in an analytical way. And this book brings that. I this is, this is definitely one of my favorite. Well, obviously, the two five stars will be my favorite. I could see this one being a standout for the year. I can't wait to do my year in review because there's been so many amazing books. But this is one, guys, where if you're like, you saw all the books I grabbed from all the long lists for this month, and you're like, I just, I can't. I highly recommend this one, especially if that, that theme is up your alley. Don't let this one go miss you um, for this year, whenever you get to it. There's another one from the women's long list, women's prize for fiction long list. And that's, and then she fell by Alicia Elliott. This one though, I didn't end this book and know what, where I was going to land with rating it. And then I finally realized this one's a five star, but this is a, this is a complex story and complex storytelling by this author, which I think Thinks, thinks speaks volumes about how well done it is. So this is going to be a book where we have a new mother. She is, uh, it, this is set in Canada. And it was funny because as an American reader, I kept forgetting that it wasn't in America. You know, you, when you think about the history here and the way we've treated the Native Americans, you know, I, it was, I've heard this, but I don't think I've actually read anything in Canada related to, to the Native Americans. So this really brought to light for me. It wasn't any better for Native Americans in Canada than in America at all. Um, so a lot of horrific learning around the treatment, the discrimination, um, the abuse of Native Americans in Canada, Canada historically. But our main character is a um, Mohawk Indian who has married a white man and therefore, she's left her reservation to move with him into a typical suburban, predominantly white community. And now she is also a new mother. And on top of this, her own mother has recently passed away. So this book is going to delve into that experience of being a new mother, being sleep deprived, postpartum struggles and difficulties, mental health, grief. And the, the, the unique component of coming from a community that has been repeatedly historically victimized over time, right? And you, you can think of like very specific, you know, I feel like pretty much a lot of communities have been perpetually victimized, but in, in, they each have their own horrific stories. So this one is definitely you know, what her her tribe had been through and how trauma is inherited and passed down and how it p impacts the community is pulled out here. But what floored me, what I was not prepared for, is how brilliantly the author took a situation where you have someone who has experienced discrimination, experienced victimization, but then you weave in mental health issues where paranoia comes in. And I found myself as the reader so lost as to when is it real and when is it my my girl, my lady here who I completely formed an attachment to, when is it her, her mind slipping? When is it mental health? When is it depression? When, like I said, when is it paranoia versus when is it valid? And by the very act of questioning her perception, you're also paralleling the very thing that she experiences with her husband or with others where discrimination is experienced and then minimized by other people or justified or or flat out denied. So then you're 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 left as the reader or I was going, God, I feel bad that I'm questioning her because now I'm doing the very thing. But she is a victim that has been her people have been discriminated against, but she's also a woman experiencing severe sleep deprivation and mental health issues. So all of a sudden you saw how complex it can be. This time it could be this and not this. So you had that component, which was enough, guys, but that is not this whole book. There are things unfolding <laughs> with her family, 
with her neighborhood as well as in her own head. And this book on layered on top of all the complexity has almost a mystery thriller aspect to it as well because of that. I think I've even seen it tagged as horror. Um, so again, it was just such a dark, compelling, on the edge of your seat read with all of this depth, all of this content for analysis. So I don't know that I said it with these, but these are another two books that I think are great reads for book clubs. In fact, I'm going to have to do a video here soon on recommendations for book clubs because these are definitely there. Um, so I, as you can tell, five stars. This is another book I definitely want to read again. Um, I would be almost curious going through this a second time what that reading journey would be like. Um, I think it would be different uh, for the second time, but nowhere lessened by the fact. You know how with some mysteries, you read them the second time, it's like, oh, it just wasn't the same. I think this one would be distinctly different, but also hold its own value because there's so much here, so much complexity. So I absolutely loved, loved this story. Um, and like I said, new mothers, uh, you have the social issues, you have grief and loss of her own mother. I mean, just the author has taken so many complex topics and masterfully woven them into a really solid, engaging story. Um, another one that'll just stick with you. So absolutely love that book. But when I put it down, I was like, I just said, like, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm writing this. And then I finally realized that's because it's a five star read. It's just one of those five star reads that it just blew your mind. That's why you didn't know how, how many stars to give it right off the bat because your mind was blown. Um, so that was it, guys. Some amazing, amazing books here. If you do end up picking any of them up, let me know below. Or if you've read them, like I said before, let me know. I would love to hear what everyone else thinks of these books. And other than that, guys, I'm so excited for the next round. So let's go read some more books. Happy reading.